Thank you, Melanie. What a beautiful song. Love the words to that song. Aren't you thankful for Christmas and what it, what it really represents, what it means to us? What does Christmas mean to you? What does it really mean to us? I'm thankful for what Christmas means. The true meaning of Christmas is that Christ came. And as the words in that song we're talking about, the fact that chains are broken. Aren't you glad that you've been set free, that you're a child of God, that you're on your way to heaven? Amen. Amen. Half of you are, the other half you haven't woken up yet. I hope to get you there before it's over with this morning. Man, I love that song. It was beautiful. Good words this morning. I want you to take your Bibles again. Turn to Psalm 137 again. As I was praying and asking the Lord to give direction on the message for today, it's the beginning of December. 
And oftentimes, you know, December, you can preach about Christmas every single Sunday. But this morning, I want to I want to preach a message. I believe God would have us hear the message today about uh, challenging us to, to truly have a joyful Christmas. How many of y'all want to really enjoy Christmas this year? Say amen. 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 I want to enjoy it. I love Christmas time. And, and uh, you know, it's sad that there's a lot of folks at this time of the year get, get very melancholy. There's people that go through Great Depression. There's some that, that go through this time of year and it's very difficult for them. And there's a lot of different reasons why people go through that. But Today I want to talk about from the spiritual aspect of how we can have the greatest Christmas of all this year. And, and to talk about the, uh, literally today we, we look at a passage of scripture here where we see that we've got God's chosen people in a place of great tragedy, a, great, a place of great sorrow. I want to read these short verses once again there if you would. We've already read it but I want to look at it again. 137 of Psalm, verse number 1. Notice what it says, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we wept. When we remembered Zion, we hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there they that carried us away captive required of us a song, and they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land is the reply. We truly see here today some verses of, of, of a very sorrowful place in life, a condition of great sorrow. And this morning, I want us to look at the, the subject of this message is the burden of the backslider. The burden of the backslider. Let's have a word of prayer. We'll delve into this. We're going to a little bit look into some of the history behind these words and then make an application to our own life. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you and praise you for all that you've given to us. Lord, I pray that we truly would be set free. And Lord, that we would not continue to live in bondage underneath the weight of the law, underneath the weight of sin, uh, bound in this world. I pray, Lord, that we would be free as a child of God. And Lord, that the song that we would sing would be a new song, a song of praise unto you, a song that we can only sing as a result of you in our life. And I pray, Lord, that you would just uh, encourage us. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would lift burdens today. I pray, Lord, you'd set people free today. Lord, I pray that our hearts would truly uh, desire to be home for Christmas with you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Here we see the, this uh, passage of Scripture. It literally is the record of the Jews and their Babylonian captivity. It's not like going on vacation, by the way. They're in captivity. They had become enslaved. You see, while back in Jerusalem, they were free, but now they're in bondage. They're in chains, you might say. They once enjoyed the blessings of the land and the blessings of the Lord, the blessing that God had given to them, and now they're literally enduring burdens. And their happiness has turned to bitterness, and their freedom has turned to slavery. Why is this so? Why have they found their place in Babylon in captivity? Why are they found themselves in a position now of not being free any longer, but being enslaved? They were God's people. They had the power of God in their life and on their land. They had the promise of God. Were they, did they find themselves in this position because of weakness? No. You all know that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. You all agree with that, right? Hey, these people had God on their side. They didn't listen. Babylon was a great power, but nothing compares to the power of God Almighty. And here we see God's children. They are now in a place of despair. They are now in a place of despondency. They are now in a place where they literally are deep down in the, in the, in the literally, you might say, in a place of being bound. And it's not because of weakness. I'll tell you what it was, though. It was because of wickedness, it was because of sin. It was because they had disobeyed God and they had turned away from God. You know, the place called Babylon, it always leads to barrenness, bitterness, and brokenness. That place, Babylon, it's a picture of something. It's a physical place here, but it pictures things as well. Babylon is identified with confusion. It goes all the way back to many, many years prior when Nimrod built the Tower of Babel. It's a place of confusion. It's a place of saying that we don't need to do it God's way. It's a place of saying that we can replace God and we can do it our way and find true joy and happiness. I'll tell you what, you'll never find it without God. 
You'll never find true joy and happiness without God. You know, the only people who were truly happy in Babylon were the Babylonians. At least they thought so for a while. But these people, God's children, these Jews, they were being chastened by the Lord for their wickedness as a nation. And now they find themselves in a terrible place. And as they sat under the shade among the willows next to the river, as you can picture it there, they could not help but reflect on the home that they had been taken from. They remembered Zion. They remembered being able to go to the temple. They remembered being able to sing songs of praise unto the Lord. But now here they are in a place of despair, and for this reason they could not play their harps, the Bible says. And I want you to know this with me. Why were they so sorrowful? I think we've already seen some reasons, but I want you to look at with me specifically today that the sadness they had, they could not shake, number one. It was sadness they could not get rid of. It was sadness that literally was on them. In verses 1 and 2, it says, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. You know, you look back at how they ended up in this position, a little bit of history about it. Israel and Judah, they went into captivity. And because of Israel and Judah's spiritual decline, according to 2 Kings chapter 17, we see that that's why they were brought into captivity, and the Lord allowed them to be taken into captivity. The Assyrians, they took Israel captive, from which it seems that they never returned according to 2 Kings 17 and 18. And Judah was then taken into captivity by the Babylonians. If You can read about that in 2 Kings chapter 18 through 25. We then see that Judah returns from captivity. After 70 years in captivity, Judah returned home in three stages. The first group was led by Zerubbabel in Ezekiel verses, uh, chapters 1 through 6. And then there was a second group that was led home by Ezra in Ezra chapters 7 through 10. And then the third group was led back by Nehemiah in Nehemiah chapter 1 through 13. And so here we see the history of the God's people and the sadness they could not shake Israel. It, there they were. They, they could not shake the sadness of being removed from the promise of the land, being removed from Zion. And yet we see God still worked with Judah and there was a return from captivity for them. And yet now they find themselves, though, in a place, though, prior to being set free, they're in great captivity, and there's a sadness they could not shake. There was misery in their hearts. We see it there. They wept. There they are in Babylonian captivities. Uh, captivity, and all they could do was think about, think about what it used to be like. Think about how they used to be free. Think about how they used to be able to worship God and how much joy it was to be able to sing praises unto God. How they used to be able to, to play the harp and to be able to lift up the name of the Lord. Sadly to say, they remember also what got them to where they're at. While the Jews were under the rule of judges, there were at least 13 apostasies where the nation of Israel continued their sinning against God. God judged them severely during that time. They continued to sin even after they were given kings to rule over them. And many of their kings would turn and to worship other gods. If you read through, you remember the stories about how they turned away from God and then there would be a revival and they would turn away from God. And, and they look back now with this knowledge of their sinning being fixed in their hearts. They could only be miserable. They were so brought down because they, they realized they were where they were at today as a result of the sin that they had committed against God. They certainly didn't think they had anything to sing about. We also see the, here, there, the taunting of the Babylonians. They tried to get them to sing. They're making a mockery, literally, of them. Why don't you sing us one of those songs of Zion? Why, why don't you sing a song like you used to sing back at your temple that has been desecrated and destroyed? Why don't you sing us one of those songs? And yet they could not sing that song because of sin. They could not sing that song because they had forfeited that place. They had left the place. They had backslidden their walk. They had walked away from God. Now, you might say, well, no, they didn't. They were brought into captivity. How did they get into captivity? It all began with them turning their back on God, with them not listening to the voice of God, the prophet of God. It all began with them making a decision that, no, I'm not going to do it your way, God. I'm going to do what I want to do. Perhaps for a season it was pleasurable. But they found themselves, as God had warned, 
they found themselves captive, bound. They'd lost their joy. They'd lost their peace. They'd lost the freedom that God had given to them. You think about it. They had such freedom. They had such joy. God had blessed them beyond measure. And yet here we see they're out of the will of the Lord, and they certainly have lost their song. Let me ask you this morning, have you lost your song? Have you lost the joy of your salvation? Have you lost the freedom that you have in Christ? You see, there was misery in their hearts. Not only that, there was the memory of their home. Later in biblical history, we're told the parable of the lost son. We see when Jesus Christ gave the parable that there is every indication that that prodigal son soon reached a state of misery while he was literally feeding the swine. You remember the story? He comes to himself. He realizes that his father's servants are, are doing better than he is doing. His father's servants are more blessed than he is. He realizes that if he would just go back and if he could just go back home and just be a, a servant to his father, he would have much better life than what he had there. And so I believe he probably, you might say, he was very homesick. He had it so good. His dad loved him. His dad took care of him. His dad blessed him, and yet he turned his back on his father, and, and he goes to that strange country, but yet he finally comes to himself. And you, you could say that he was, it, it, literally, that he was in memory of his home. And, and we see here that these, these children of Israel, they are in memory of their home, and they are very sorrowful. It's kind of sadness, the kind of sadness that caused them to take their harps and to hang them there on those willows. They couldn't sing a song. You know, to the backslidden church member, there is great loss that comes in not being plugged in to your church home. There's great loss. There's great loss for that, that child of God who once served and perhaps once was in the choir, perhaps once taught a Sunday school class, perhaps once worked on the bus route, perhaps once was involved in being an usher, and, and yet now they've walked away, and, and, and there's such loss in that. They lost the song that they once had. But you know, it's not just for the one that's walked away as far as physical terms are concerned. There's great loss also in the person that's just going through the motions. They're punching the time clock. They get up and do their thing. They go through the motions. And yet they've lost that joy. The joy in serving God. The joy in worshiping God. The joy of being in church. Of being able to lift up a song, it's not just, well, I guess we got to sing this song and I'll, I'll go through it and I'll do it. They lost that joy. You know, I can only imagine how awful it would be for me to be removed from my church family. I praise God for this church family. I don't ever want to be removed from this church family. I can only imagine what it, would be, what it would be like for me to be plugged into the church and just going through the motions. I don't want to get to that place. It needs to be something that, and I say need, it should be something because of the fact of why we do what we do. It should be a joyful thing. It's not a grievous thing. not a grievous thing for us to serve the Lord. We see here this caused their hearts, number one, to be sad because of how they feel, felt. Listen, sin will make your heart sad. Let me say that again. It, it seems so simple, does it not? Sin will make your heart sad. People think that they can go out and sin, that they're going to have such a great time. Let me tell you, it's not a great time to get into sin. It brings death. It brings destruction. You know, there's a wonderful joy that causes continual rejoicing when one thinks upon the things of God. When we will think about what God has done, when we think about how God has blessed us, the Bible says this in Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9, one of my favorite passages of Scripture, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your heart and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, listen to it. 
What sort of things are true? What sort of things are honest? What sort of things are just? What sort of things are pure? What sort of things are lovely? What sort of things are good report? If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. And the God of peace shall be with you. There are a lot of Christians today that are not living in peace. There are a lot of Christians today that are backslidden. They're living in sin. They, they're thinking about all the wrong things. They're thinking about things that will bring harm to themselves. They're thinking about things that will literally hurt them and people around them. They're not thinking on the good things. And as a result of it, because they're not thinking about things the way they should, they have no peace. We talk about Christmas time, peace on earth, goodwill to men. Remember talking about having the best Christmas of all? Listen, if you are at peace with God, you will have a great Christmas. If you are at peace with yourself because you're living the way you should, you will have a great Christmas. It says, those things which ye have both learned, verse 9, and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. You know, when you allow sin to overtake you, you cannot keep your mind fixed on God. You're so messed up in your mind and your thinking. And as a result of it, it causes hearts to be sad. That's what happened here with the children of Israel. Because of sin, their hearts are sad. It caused their hearts to be sad. Number two, it caused their harps to be silent. The song was no longer there. You know, the first thing that comes to mind when I see the harps hanging on the willows, I think of it this way. I think of talents going to waste. You know how many times I've heard people say, well, boy, I'll tell you what, I sure can sing good. Boy, I sure can do this. I, I used to be involved in doing this in church. I used to be in the choir. I used to teach a Sunday school class. I used to be there for this. I, I, you know what? I even used to go door to door soul winning. But now they've literally taken their harp and they're hanging it up on a willow tree. They're sad. They're not doing what they used to do. They're in a backslidden state. They don't have any peace. They don't have any joy. They've got so much talent. They have so many gifts that God has blessed them with, but they're not using it for the Lord. You want to be miserable? Live like that. There is sadness that comes from it, and it causes for our song to be silent. Why not use the talent that God has given to us for Him? Why not use our time talent for Him? Let me ask you this morning, has something robbed you of your song? I mean, has there been a time and a place in your life when you had peace in your life, you had joy in your life, there was a song in your heart? Here we see that God's people, the Israelites, their harps were silent. Why? Because they were separated from their fathers. They were surrounded by their foes. They were saddened by their failures. They were shaken by their fears. Does that describe anything in your life today? We see secondly, notice with me if you would in verse number 3 of our text, Psalm 137, we see the sarcasm that could, they could not stand. The sarcasm they could not stand. Look at it right there. Verse number 3, For they, there they that carried us away captive required of us a song, and they that wasted us required of us myrrh, saying, "Huh, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. Listen, I'm telling you, when they're saying this to them, this is not because they wanted to learn about their God. They literally are rubbing it in their face. You mark it down, now listen to me. The devil, when he leads you into captivity, back again from where your freedom was in Christ, back into the bondage of sin once again, you can mark it down. When you get to the end of that, he's going to mock you. He is going to make fun of you. He is going to accuse you. You think those friends that are yours that are leading you in the wrong direction, that are causing you to do the wrong thing, and, and, and they encourage you to step out. Hey, go out and have some fun as a child of God. Don't be so stuck in the mud. And when you get to go doing those things, you wait and see how much they really are your friend. They're going to mock you. Boy, I thought that he was a person that never drank. They'll get you drunk and they'll mock you. Boy, I thought that she was one that was going to keep herself pure before marriage. They'll rob you of it and they'll mock you. Nothing more than a number. 
That's just a couple of examples. But there are people today, literally, that are around. And here we see these Babylonians. They're mocking them. Those that were proud people of God, now they're in a position of being underneath great uh, a hardship. They're literally bound. And they are in a position now where sarcasm is cast at them. It's causing great depression for them. You see, they could only remember how it was before they were separated from the home that they now look back to. I'll tell you what, that should be the spirit of every backslider. You ought to remember where you used to be. The reason why they were depressed at this moment was because they remembered how it used to be. Do you remember how it was when you were right with God? Do you remember how it was when you were doing what you should be doing for the, as a child of God? Do you remember how it was when you first got saved, how you had the joy of your salvation? Do you remember how it was when it was a joy to serve God? When it wasn't a hard thing to, be, to say, I've got to be in church? Do you remember how it was? Do you remember how your family was plugged into the things of God? Do you remember how you looked forward to going to the meeting place? Listen, maybe you've hung your harps on the willow. And because of that, the world sees that you've removed yourself from the fervor of serving God. The world sees that you're not where you used to be. And the world would look at you with sarcasm, just as the Babylonians looked at the, these Jews who were removed from their country. They said to them, sing your songs, play your harps. But all that did was bring further hurt to them. All it did was remind them once again that they had lost the joy. You see, sin brings things to our life. It brings many terrible things. Sin brings about, number one, slavery. It will enslave you. Slavery of the worst kind is the slavery that comes to the sinner. It's far worse than being bound in chains physically. Sin will bind you. Listen, you are under the bondage of Satan. He has you right where he wants you. You have lost your song. You are in shackles spiritually. It feels like that God is not even there in your life. It feels like you have no answers to prayer. It feels like there is no way out. You may even be addicted to your sin and sinning. So much so that you feel like you cannot break free. And unless you throw yourself on the altar of God's mercy, you will never be free again. There's only but one way you'll be set free, and that is through the power of God in your life. And it's a choice that you have to make because sin, listen, it is something that literally brings about slavery. Sin brings about, number two, it brings shame upon you. Here the Jews, they were in bondage. They, they weren't proud professors of their homeland that they once were. They're now subjects of shame. You know, any backslidden sinner has every reason to be ashamed. Any person who is a child of God who has been set free, who is back in bondage and underneath that, the, the bondage of sin, they ought to be shameful for where they are at. I'll tell you what. And as a result of it, any person in that condition, they've lost their song. It's been robbed from them. Sin brings slavery, it brings shame, it also brings suffering. It brings suffering. The Word of God tells us that the way of the transgressor is hard. Listen to me, young people. The way of the transgressor is hard. Are you listening today? The way of the transgressor is hard. The person that turns their back on God and breaks the laws of God, it's going to be a very hard road for them to walk. It's going to be a very difficult thing. It's going to be, bring slavery. It's going to bring shame. It's going to bring suffering on your life. You say, preacher, why are you preaching a message like this? It's Christmas season. Because there's a lot of people that literally are going into this time of the year when we're supposed to be celebrating that greatest gift of all, that gift that breaks the chains, that sets us free, and yet there are those who are children of God who are again in bondage. They don't have the peace. They don't have the joy that they once had. Why? Because sin brings slavery, it brings shame. It brings suffering. I've seen it so many times. It's not just something I'm saying. It's something I have actually seen. By the way, whether I've seen it or not, the Word of God says it's true. 
So it's absolute truth. But I'm telling you, I can say amen to it because I have seen the way of the transgressor is hard. I have seen it where young people who, who got saved, young people who began to serve the Lord, young people who came to a crisis decision in their life, whether they were going to follow God or go back and follow the world. And I've seen them go both ways. I'm telling you, I have seen the young man that has surrendered to preach. I've seen that young man turn his back on God. I've seen that young man end up in a place out in, in, in California with an alternate lifestyle, die of AIDS. The way of the transgressor is hard. I have seen young people who they have such a desire to want to marry somebody. They, they think that this one loves them and they decide to not listen to mom and dad. They decide to step outside that boundary mom and dad have set for them. To step out beyond that, the hedge that was set to protect them, thinking that they can have a lot of fun and joy. And listen, they end up so broken. It brings shame. It brings sorrow. It brings slavery. I've seen the young person that says, you know what, just one drink won't hurt. You know, I keep saying young people because young people, oftentimes, these are temptations, but you know what, this message is not just for young people. There are people here today that could stand up and say, hey, this is a young person. The way of the transgressor is hard. I've been down that road. Don't go down that road. Don't go that road. Sin brings suffering. Thirdly, this morning, lastly, I want you to notice with me here in verse number four, notice the song that they could not sing. The song they could not sing. Look at verse four. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? How can we sing the song of Zion? How can we sing praises unto God? We're under shame. We've been shackled. We have such sorrow. I can't sing the song. You see, out of despair, knowing that the place that they were in was a place that was not like the temple. It was not the place like they were in at home. They were away from the Lord. They had lost the right to sing that song. They had lost the right to sing the song. Just as those who are living in sin are bound by sin, they cannot sing that song they once sang in their life. They just can't do it. They can't get up and sing, I mean, truthfully from their heart, songs of joy and praise unto God. Why? They don't have joy. They can't sing songs of uh, the fact that God brings peace. Why? They don't have peace. I mean, I'm not talking about for us physically. It might be people sitting in pews just like this in churches just like this across the country, but they're not able to sing the song of praise unto God because they're in a backslidden state. They've been bound by sin. And here we see that we, the, here these Jews, they had lost the right. They, they were literally in a position where they could not sing those songs. In John 8, 34, it tells us this. Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. A person living in sin is, in, is enslaved to sin. In Romans chapter 6, I want you to turn there if you would. Take your Bible, turn over to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, look at verse number 1. Romans chapter 6, look at verse number 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Everybody read the next two words. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not? That so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. What's the point? God doesn't want us to stay in that place of sin. God wants us to be delivered from that place of sin. And the good news is we can. 
And listen, only those who are free can sing the Lord's song. You can be free today, by the way. You don't have to continue down the road of sin. You don't have to continue down the, the way of transgressors. God can set us free. In Romans 6, 4, there we see that verse. It says, we also should walk in newness of life. God wants us to walk in newness of life. You know what? Every single day. God wants us to walk in newness of life. I'll tell you what, that'll put a song back in your life if you're walking in the newness of life. Now, what does that mean? That means that I'm dead to myself. That means that my sins are under the blood of Jesus Christ. That means that I claim the power of God in my life. That means that I say, God, I know I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sins. Lord, I know that I've been wrong. It's talking about a time of repentance in our life. And we step away and we say, God, I want to walk in the newness of life. By the way, when you got saved, that's exactly what happened. You became a child of God. And unfortunately, there, there are Christians, and, and every one of us, I believe that every single child of God, there are times in our life when we backslide. Every one of us. This message is for all of us today. You might be sitting there thinking, boy, I don't know who this message is for. It's for me. It's for you. There, there are so many Christians today that are just going through the motions. I mean, they're just... They're just doing it because they have to do it. But they're, they, don't, they don't do it. Their harps are hanging up over there. And they're not really doing it because they love the Lord. They're doing it because it's something they got to do. Man, it ought not be that way. There's so many Christians today that, that truly have lost their joy. They've lost their song. And the reason why is because they're in bondage. It might not be physically something we can see, but I'm telling you spiritually, it's in their heart. They're bound. But only those who are free can sing the Lord's song. Look back at chapter 12, uh, 6, if you would. Look at verse 12. Here we see how to really be free. Let's look at it. How can we really be free? Here it is. You see it? Chapter 6, verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, shall not have power over you. You will not be bound by sin, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Aren't you thankful today you're not under the law? That's practical application to everyday life, folks. This is not just something that is positionally in heaven. This is something that is practical right now. And we can have that freedom. We can have that joy. We can have that song. We can, listen, how do we do it? We yield not our members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but we yield ourselves to God. Amen. Are you yielded fully to God today? Does He have all of you? Have you submitted yourself to God? Have you surrendered your all to Him? You see, only one thing can make us lose our song for Christ. Does anybody know what it is? It's a three-letter word. Sin. That's the only thing. You think God wants you to have that song in your life? You think God wants you to have peace? You think God wants you to be set free? You think He wants you to have joy unspeakable and full of glory? He th do you think He wants you to have the joy of your salvation, which is your strength? You think He wants for you to be able to sing that song? The only thing robbing you from that is sin. And the truth is, you look at Christians today, most people are not living with freedom. They're not living with peace. They're not living with joy. They're not living with a song. And the reason for it is sin. And so knowing that, let's come back to where we really belong. You know, for these Israelites that were bound in bondage in Babylon, it was a bad thing for them. These that were singing or not singing the song, they couldn't just say, God, please forgive me. They were bound. Now, their relationship with God could get right, but they couldn't get back to their promised land. Spiritually, aren't you thankful today for this verse? Now, listen to this verse. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God will set you free. You need to come back to Him. That's the only thing that will allow us to be free and have victory is through Jesus Christ. The only thing that keeps us from that is sin. You know, I hope this simple message this morning from the book of Psalm 
I hope it ignites a fire of desire in your hearts to return to the Lord. Just as the Lord spoke to Israel through the prophet Malachi in chapter 3 and verse 7, he said this. Listen to what it says. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, I'm not going to read the rest of that verse in just a moment. But he says there, return unto me, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will return unto you. Maybe God is speaking to your heart today, and God is he literally, He is knocking in your heart's door, and He's saying, hey, return unto me. Maybe today the reason why you don't have joy when you come to church is because you need to return unto Him. Maybe today you need to return unto Him so that when you sing songs, they'll truly be songs of praise, and you don't have peace in your life. It's because you need to return unto Him. You know what the sad truth is, though, is the rest of this verse. Do you see what it says there? But the people, they responded when God spoke to them. They responded, wherein shall we return? They were so blind by sin, they couldn't even see the condition they were in. Oh, to God, that God would open the eyes of people today, that God would allow them to see where they're at, that people would have a heart of repentance, that people would turn back to God and would not continue in sin and losing their joy, losing their peace, losing the freedom that they have. Oh, to God, that we would have Christians that today would realize that they need to repent and get back on their, their knees before God and give their life to the Lord. Where are you at today? When was the last time that God spoke to your heart where you were actually moved to do something? When was the last time you got on your knees before God and gave your life to Him? When was the last time that you gave your all to Him and so God could use the talent that He's blessed you with? Do you have joy, peace? Let's all stand with our heads bowed and eyes closed.